Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Automation and Analytics in RCM, Three Effective Ways to Streamline Decision-Making and Boost Performance. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. First, we will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Second, today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access that recording. Third, we will have a series of poll questions during today's webinar. You can submit the answer that best applies to you directly on your screen in the slides box. Thank you in advance for your participation. Then lastly, if at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We are here to help. And with that, I am pleased to welcome today's speakers. We have John Giuliani, Vice President of Operations at Healthcare Financial Resources. John joined HFRI in 2015. During his tenure, he helped revamp HFRI's operations to become less labor intensive and more efficient through automation and advanced analytics. HFRI has experienced significant gains in productivity and revenue during his time. Today, John now directs the operations, sales, and marketing departments at HFRI. Before joining HFRI, John oversaw and managed a business analyst unit within Philips Healthcare. We also have Daniel Lau, Director of Operations at Healthcare Financial Resources. Dan started his career with HFRI as a collection supervisor and has held multiple roles within the company over the years, including quality assurance manager and senior client program manager. Dan has over 15 years of hospital revenue cycle experience. John and Daniel, thank you for being here today. John, I will now turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Aaliyah. And thank you to everyone who is listening. Dan and I are excited for the opportunity to discuss what we feel is a very important topic with you all today. Now, as most of you out there already are aware, for hospitals and health systems, it very much feels like external forces are converging to make it increasingly difficult to consistently optimize revenue cycle management and sustain predictable cash flow. On the front end, transparency regulations and consumer-driven health care are imposing new market realities on traditional hospital business models. That, along with the ever-increasing complexities within revenue cycle management, the trend of the shrinking hospital margin continues to go in the wrong direction, unfortunately. Then when you factor in the COVID impact on our operations, it's becoming clear RCM leaders can no longer expect traditional revenue cycle processes to produce the desired results. Which brings us to why we're here today to discuss strategies on how to utilize automation and analytics to streamline your revenue cycle and boost overall performance. Dan and I like to refer to this as our RCM playbook for handling AR. Now, Dan will dive into these areas in more detail in just one moment, but you know, first, our mission to improve our rev cycle was to develop tools that would allow us to automate as many human touches as we possibly could. Plus, we want to maximize claim rep quality and productivity on every account that truly required a manual touch. Now, as a starting point, we knew we needed data in order to drive everything we wanted to accomplish. And sure enough, this is where we see a lot of hospitals and health systems struggle when it comes to applying automation and utilizing tools for their employees. And what I mean by that is the impact of dark data. So for those of you not familiar with that term, it basically refers to unstructured and untapped data that has not been analyzed or processed in a meaningful way. 
And with the wealth of information available to us in this industry, I'm sure we can all think of a million examples where this is occurring at our shops. Though, even if you think your organization does a solid job parsing out your data, keep in mind this term can still be applied for when we're not being effective in connecting the available data from all of our systems. Think charge master, contract management, clearing houses, EDI data, payroll websites, your billing systems. All of these systems and data need to communicate well with each other in order to truly impact your revenue cycle process. And this can be a challenge for any organization. And there's typically many hands involved with managing and utilizing these sources. And that's where robotic processing and intelligent automation can make a big impact. So what we did was we utilized technology that was already out there. We combined it with per personalizing it for our needs, as well as creating our own system to harness all this information. This allowed us to parse out and map EDI data in a way that truly told the story on what was going to happen on every single claim. And when you're able to map out your EDI, as well as utilize bots to check for missing critical information, whether it's either in your contract management um, um, system or your payer websites, it really opens up the door, not just for pure automation, but also creating foolproof process flows within your own systems. And according to a recent analysis by the American Hospital Association, hospitals are projected to lose about $44 billion in net income through 2021. The analysis stated that the reduced income reflects the ongoing effects of the pandemic, you know, including fewer outpatient um, visits, high costs for supplies, labor, medications. Um, you know, so I think we can all agree on the importance of becoming more efficient in utilizing technology. Oftentimes, I'll hear from our colleagues out there in the industry, well, we know what needs to happen. We just don't have the technology like other industries do to make it happen. And while I agree, when it comes to revenue cycle management, technology may not be as advanced as other industries right now. Though the technologies hospitals need to streamline their RCM process is already here. Another interesting data point I read recently was that it usually takes about 20 years for the invention of a new process to be adapted widespread. For example, Six Sigma has been around for a very long time before it got popular in the 80s. Just in time and lean manufacturing that came from Japan in the 70s, yet didn't get popular over here until the 90s. So my hope is that it doesn't take until 2040 until the rest of the revenue cycle adapts to what we're about to cover. Um, and as I hand things over to Dan, what he's really going to harp on is how we utilize data and technology to ensure pricing, coding, and reimbursement expectations are set up correctly on the front end. Also, how this information allows us to truly identify hidden issues causing delayed payments. And also, segment those problems by either issues to correct internally, EMR edits to help eliminate problems or issues on the payer side that just need to be addressed. Plus, your data can always be applied to set up safety net rules that even after your teams have closed an account, you can discover if there's missed reimbursement opportunity there. But more importantly, he'll walk you through how we utilize technology to not only automate process and tasks, but also guide our users on each and every step to ensure you can boost your productivity and eliminate mistakes. And with that, I'll hand things over to Dan. All right, John, thank you very much for that. All right, um, hi everyone. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to be over here with us today. As mentioned earlier, my name is Daniel Lau. I'm the Director of Operations at Healthcare Financial Resources. Uh, today's webinar is focused on automation and analytics. Uh, we're going to be discussing three areas to target in regards to automation so that your operation can ensure performance improvement. Uh, we're going to be kicking things off with decision tree process and auto notation. Uh, we're then going to dive into denial and contract management analytics and opportunity for netting of inventory. Uh, and finally, we'll be reviewing the importance of front end revenue integrity analysis as well as zero balance forensic retro analysis. So the first few slides will allow us to set the table 
to describe the current environment that we're all living in and why automation is so pivotal to improving an organization's efficiency. And identifying your major pain points will also help you identify where your automation opportunities exist and direct them to start looking for wins. So first of all, the current environment for AR insurance follow-up is a call center type environment in which team members are required to achieve consistent production in order to ensure account work queues are churned through in appropriate timeframes. And if consistent follow-up is not achieved, revenue will be lost due to insurance carrier time limits. And production improvement becomes top priority as aging and small balance accounts start to have an immediate impact if not worked through consistently. The aged and small dollar claims are automatically pushed to the wayside, which in turn clogs up work queues, increasing staff workload, and increasing bad debt reserves. So in addition to this, staff are usually compensated in about the $15 to $25 an hour range. And the difficulties involved in the AR position are not always comparable to the pay ranges, which make it difficult to recruit qualified candidates for account work that's required. And this also makes it difficult to achieve your desired production outcomes. And there's so many desk procedures and steps to those procedures that the AR team members need to remember in order to do their jobs effectively. And with team members across the country moved into a work from home environment, managing these team members also adds another level of complexity to ensure performance requirements are achieved. So quality management with a new team member as well as a tenured employee is requiring more, fo more focus than ever. So that leads us into some staffing challenges. So continuing with the current environment, you know, this slide is going to be discussing some additional staffing challenges that everyone is, is working through right now. And, you know, the current ramp up time for a brand new team member with no experience can take six to 12 months to get them up and running. And performance, which ties heavily to margin levels, make this extended ramp up time a significant struggle for operational managers trying to achieve their key performance metrics. And even once the team member is ramped up, desk procedures, web portals, EMR systems, all those things John was alluding to at the beginning are all undergoing constant change, requiring a never ending training focus to keep team members up to speed. So creating training materials and walking team members through these processes is a massive task for any organization to stay on top of. You know, this also assumes that everyone is keeping track of all of the tasks. <laughs> um, and that's a lot easier said than done as almost every day new trends, denials, system updates, et cetera, are being identified or are going live. So making sure your management team, training team is staying current on everything is a task that also needs to be managed. And when creating these training materials, the more detailed your process is, the more efficient your staff is going to become. So there are so many opportunities to improve performance by ensuring everyone is familiar with their tools, and how to use those tools so that can save them time and increase productivity. And since ramp up time can be extensive and is usually not just plug and play, turnover is extremely important to keep to a minimum. Or if your turnover is high, the time to get people up to speed has to increase in order to maintain efficiency. And this is still going to be continued to, to set the table as we walk through this, um, and we'll start talking about performance improvement in a moment. Um, if we go to the next slide here, you know, insurances are constantly identifying claims that they either do not agree with reimbursing as expected, are hiding rejections or underpayment in codes not normally associated with underpayment, or are flat out denying claims due to operational failures between their teams. Payers also have the same operational difficulties that the providers have in bringing their staff up to speed. So identifying and managing all the known issues or problems becomes a full-time job for any manager or team to stay on top of. And some logistical issues facing team members and management are, first off, just locating the problems and seeing if you can even quantify that issue. 
This step alone can take significant analytical resources to continuously monitor and clarify as being a real problem. Um, explaining those issues to team members and then training them on how to resolve, including your resolution options, as there's always variables for every situation, it seems, in, in our industry. And managers and trainers are constantly having to update process flows to keep their team members performing as required. And then, you know, finding a way to track those issues and verify if they are improving or if team members are following the correct steps or processes for each of those updated processes. This requires QA, operational, and training departments to all be on the same page in order to ensure staff are up to date on understanding all of the current processes. Um, and also working with the payers to see if they can fix anything in bulk or anything that you identify instead of having that worked manually. As your management team is consistently identifying areas of opportunity with the insurance carriers, you know, do you have payer calls set up to target mass resolution or stop erroneous issues from continuously happening? So all of those things put together, you know, it kind of begs the question of, you know, or really the statement, we have to do everything it takes to make a successful employee work. So every minute and every dollar you spend working with your team members is definitely worth it to ensure that they perform better. Higher performance is going to mean more revenue. It's going to mean better margin. But with thousands of remittance codes carriers apply on, the, on their EOBs comes a never-ending number of processes that your employees have to become masters of. So can you remember every process off the top of your head on how to deal with AR follow-up? And whether it's been a while or you're still currently do it, most likely the answer to this is no. And this is the same struggle that your staff is running through on a daily basis. And a lot of things can cause an account to go off in the wrong direction. And while this may seem common knowledge that experienced staff could, could identify, when a newer person or a struggling team member is working an account, which I'm sure we all have in our operation, having a system guided platform will greatly assist in improving that performance. So in regard to insurance AR follow-up, a team member has to be able to review an EOB and or an EMR system to figure out what the root issue is that encompasses over 3,000 CARC and RARC variations. And each payer may be using that stuff separately. So if you think about your top 10 payers, you know, that becomes a ton of rules that you have to remember and have to understand. And if you add in specific payer guidelines, differences in utilization of codes, carriers even using their own codes that don't even reconcile to the existing codes, which I think John was talking about the issues earlier and, and, and making sure that we can get everything to tie in regards to data, this clearly becomes a significant challenge that we're all dealing with across this industry. So the creation of training materials and ensuring knowledge transfer is that it's most efficient will allow staff to perform at their highest level. And the more of the processes that are automated or built into your system, the less your team members need to pivot and shift between viewing different process flows or training materials, saving them significant time. And setting your staff's daily work focus to target like issues can ensure the highest output possible. But in order to get to this level, mapping is required of those EDI data and any dark data that John was referencing earlier. The more different issues that are available in a team member's daily focus, the more they need to remember, and the more there's opportunity for error. So removing these manual processes increases staff efficiency and reduces unnecessary touches. So I know we've gone over quite a bit so far, um, but what I wanted to do is dive into a quick poll question. And if everyone could please fill out this uh, or uh, select an option that applies to you. You know, how many procedures or processes does your operation currently have? If you could select uh, the option that works for you, we'd greatly appreciate that. And again, uh, we'll give it about 30 seconds. So thank you guys again very much for your time today and being on this call. Go ahead and give it about 15 more seconds here.
All right, about five more. And we'll go ahead and see the results here. One more moment, looks like we have more results coming in. And again, do your best to estimate, even if you're not 100% positive. All right, so it looks like we have a significant number of you that are unsure in terms of your total processes, and I completely understand that because uh, from looking at this from our side, we have about 1,200 different scenarios that we have identified through our mapping of issues and process flow. And those can derive from a group of 25 to 50 or 100 main procedures, but there are so many different avenues to go. And as I can see here, there's many of you who list greater than 100 or 50 to 100 or 25 to 50. Those are a lot of processes for people to remember all of the different outputs on. So. Uh, thank you all very much for your insight on that. Mm -hmm. If we go to the next slide here, um, apologize real fast. Sorry, something uh, happened here. Apologize. All right, so. Going into uh, technology, um, th the current revenue cycle space, while improving from a technology standpoint, is historically not in the forefront of automation and ease of simplification rules between payers and providers. Um, it is not as straightforward as it could be, making aut automation sometimes more difficult than it needs to be. So the big question is, are you working on solutions to help with this constant operational struggle? And if not, this will put your organization at an extreme disadvantage as time goes on. Targeting major areas of opportunity and reducing manual effort will help to improve margins and reduce operational stress. So some major questions I'm sure everyone has been asking them themselves in regards to automation is, do we build or do we buy? And what type of potential solutions are even out there? And, you know, what type of, or how beneficial is it to invest resources and time on fixing this issue? Each of those questions is specific to your operation and its needs. And if you have not mapped out an overview of your areas for automation opportunity, I would think that would be really a great first step in terms to identifying your needs. So the next slide is gonna be talking about targeting a solution. Um, now that we've set the table for the current environment and discussed staffing, payer, and technology challenges, I really wanted to walk you through how we're dealing with this issue internally and what solution we are utilizing to combat these challenges. So a few years ago, we did an analysis that identified when an account is worked incorrectly the first time, it can impact your opportunity to collect by 50% on average. And this is a especially important to us as we are a vendor to providers and usually can get claims at different ranges from discharge. Our timely filing deadlines are shorter than what it would be if we were the provider. So the question that we pose to ourselves is how to ensure that the account is worked correctly from the beginning and ensure our team members follow the correct process. And it was this exact problem that prompted our company to think how we could use an automated system and our process flows in a different manner to come up with a unique solution to target this problem. And a major starting point was utilizing 835 and 837 data. The 835 data allows for us to pinpoint an account's major issue. That issue can then be mapped into a root category to allow for distribution of like problematic issues, allowing for team members to increase productivity and reduce errors by working less and more targeted problems. Mapping all of these CARC and RARC combinations into classifications may definitely take some time, but the data insight and the opportunity for process improvement is 100% worth the energy and effort. Um, you know, what we aim to do as a solution was to build a platform that took into consideration 
all desk procedures and potential variables to provide an automated decision tree guidance platform to increase staff efficiency and minimize error. Our system identifies the core issue at the time of placement and then maps it to a root cause. That root cause is then linked to an automated decision tree, which then replaces the manual Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Adobe, et cetera, desk procedure document. And the decision trees or automated process modules are able to be updated by our team leads, our supervisors, and our managers through an interface, which takes IT out of the solution for a more streamlined approach. And during our analysis, what we also identified is that a team member summarizing their overview on the account can spend anywhere from one to 15 minutes generating a note summary of what they did and what the next steps are. So our platform, as you'll see in this upcoming demo in a second, is a solution for automating guidance as well as notation to improve overall quality, production, and ease of the job. It also allows for complete customization of the processes at all times, reducing the need for additional training, QA, and IT assistance. Um, as you'll see, the modules become the source of truth for everything. And in addition, it forces team members to complete all the required steps and complete them in the same manner, ensuring that you get your desired efficiency and, and processes. Um, the system's core focus is to reduce life cycle, uh, time reducing the cost to collect while improving staff performance, which results in revenue improvement. So with that all being said, I will go ahead and start the demo. Once I click begin, this kind of starts my walkthrough of an account. When walking through an account, um, the first thing you can see is just the same overview that we saw on the prior page. And this is kind of our work through or process flow system. And this is how we're going to be guided through working an account. Before starting working this account, kind of pointing out a few things here is that we have these objective sections in yellow here on the left hand side. And these are guidance points to remind people to do certain things as they're working through an account. There's also going to be a bunch of Q&A that people are going to be clicking through and walking through. And as they fill out this information, as well as the summary detail from the claim info on the right here, it's going to be automatically generating a note that would be easy to understand, as well as summarizing all the steps that we're taking while working through this account. So with that, let's kind of get started working through this. Um, you know, you would be working alongside of your EMR system and your clearinghouse as you're uh, working into this system. And the more information you can input into the system, the more uh, opportunity to automatically guide people into certain processes. So uh, let's get started. Um, assuming that we go into our system and we know the claims denied for out of network, first thing we look at is our EMR system. Let's say we go into the EMR system and the entire claim is rejecting as out of network. And again, the guidance point is saying patients are required to receive services from certain doctors and facilities that are in network. Services received out of network must be medically relevant or necessary. So if I click continue here, it's saying, was it outside the patient's control to visit an out of network provider? Well, the objective is now updated saying, review the claim Were the services ambulatory, emergency, specialty care, hospital transfer, lab work, or something that was outside of a patient's control uh, when they went to visit this um, out of network provider. So what we're looking at is, you know, I look at this procedure code, it looks like it's radiology. And, you know, assuming I could look at medical records to make that determination, or I could just say, hey, I know that this was within the patient's control, I can click on within the patient's control. And since services were within that patient's control to go in, in network, review your client procedures to verify whether the balance is truly patient portioned. So this would be where you look at an EOB and see if there's a PR or a CO or um, any other type of um, group code to describe what to do with it. Now, as you're working through the account, you can actually be updating this information as well on the right hand side. So assuming I received all my information from my EMR system, I could say it was Epic in this instance. 
Um, let's say that my claim number is one, two, three, four, five, six that I did verify from the EOB itself. Uh, we can say that the claim in this example um, looks like it was received or submitted to the carrier on February 3rd and looks like they process based on the EOB date on February 10th. Um, they allowed $8,000, they paid $0, and with that information, you can see that it's populating a lot of that note detail on the left-hand side here. Once you're completed, you can hit save with that, and we can continue with our Q&A follow-up. So the remaining balance is patient portion. Let's say there's a PR group code, and United Healthcare is saying that the patient is responsible, so we are going to click that. Once that is done, um, there's a few pieces of information that needs to be filled out. So is the patient going to be built? Well, yes. And the reason is going to be out of network. Oh, if we look at that information, we can save that. And you can see the note is completely summarized here on the left. As you can see from the demo, this is what we came up with as a solution to our biggest operational hurdle, which was to force every team member to follow the most up-to-date version of the stack procedures and reduce the time they spend creating their summary note as well as a live environment to update all known issues with their own process flows. And for the purpose of this demo, we used a very basic process flow with minimal variables but we have hundreds of these modules that get extremely specific and require consistent updating as new steps or processes are identified. So the modules and objectives are able to be updated and customized as much as required in order to get people to perform where we're looking. Um, we have a poll question in front of us, and in terms of how you guys uh, monitor your process flows, um, are you use, utilizing Microsoft products um, are you working on an internal build? Um, are you working with an internal share drive um, automation platform or IA rule-based software? Or we do not have any desk procedures. And I'll give about 30 seconds to have this filled out. And we'll go ahead and keep moving forward with the webinar. And thank you guys very much for your time and your feedback. Give it about 15 more seconds here. All right. Looks like we have about 35% of people with responses. I'll give it about 10 more seconds. All right, so if we look at the response here, um, and really kind of what I expected here was that, you know, a lot of people are utilizing Microsoft products for this, especially Excel and PowerPoint and, and Word documents. Um, it's great to see that uh, some people are working on internal builds for their processes, that is great to see. Um, shared drives, completely understand that as well. Um, all those documents have to be placed and available somewhere. Um, great to see that 22% uh, of you, or almost 23%, are using an automation platform or rule-based software. And um, I definitely understand where there wouldn't be any desk procedures at all. And you know, working to uh, work with your operational team on, on having those set up is, is a long-term goal and can take time to complete. So uh, thank you guys so much for your input there. All right. So um, on the next slide here, in order to keep a program like the one we created as efficient as possible, we have to be all over analytics and the automation of information to be at our fingertips at all times. So EDI data review, um, you know, constant analysis of Kark and Rark combinations is required to ensure that we're first correctly identifying the root problem and then that our process flows are driven by that mapping. And in addition, it's always looking at denial information that allows for new trends to be identified in real time. Uh, we're going to be going over examples of denial scorecards in a moment, and our scorecards run off of the same information as well. 
And finally on the slide, contract management reconciliation. Um, you know, it's pivotal in order to reduce unnecessary and wasted touches on accounts that are just not correctly netted in the system itself. Um, so these are going to be the major highlights that we're discussing for the second portion of this webinar. So going into EDI data, um, if you're unfamiliar with mapping of EDI data, it is worth the time and effort to classify your rejections. And sometimes mapping an issue requires a unique set of guidelines. So some examples here is if you're looking at EDI data to figure out a root cause, sometimes only the CART code matters and you want to ignore the RARC code. Sometimes you have to combine the CART and the RARC together to get to the root issue. And sometimes the CART doesn't mean anything at all. So we're already making this complex here. <laughs> and then combining the CARC, RARC, and payer, or even the procedure, helps you to also determine potential issues. And utilizing CARC and RARC and payment amount are also other ways that can help you get to root causes. So having mapping set up in these types of scenarios is very helpful. And also, sometimes combinations of codes mean nothing at all. And you need to ignore certain codes and create a hierarchy system before you can determine what your winning problem is. So in order to do this, your day-to-day -day staff is crucial in ensuring the mapping of your issues is changing as needed. And in addition to determining a root cause, every state is potentially different and has its own processes. And every hospital has its own unique set of issues based on their billing processes. So it's not a, a one solution fits all approach. You have to figure out what ultimately works for your team. Now there are like issues that people are seeing across the country that can be applied, but a lot of the times your issues are based on your customized um, focuses or areas of opportunity based on your billing program and your state. And having an interface that allows for constant mapping updates to be made is gonna be also critical for identifications of issues and potentially working them in mass or creating edits to automate or reduce a manual touch. So going into an example of a scorecard here, um, while I'm sure everybody has on the call has their own payer metric that you guys use to measure performance on each of your top payers, you know, it's very critical to look at each payer on at least a weekly or a monthly basis to see if there's any changes. Um, there are new problems that happen on the provider and payer side all the time, um, causing large groups of accounts to go unpaid that may have not had that issue previously. Um, and a good starting point is to look at your average charges built versus your contractual applied. Then compare your allowable amounts for those claims. Um, you can also verify what portion went to the patient um, out of that allowable, that will tell you a great story into why your cash is coming in quicker or slower. Um, and comparing your allowable yield versus your pay yield is also a really good high-level overview as well. Um, then looking into why these numbers are going up or down will ensure that you're finding ways to improve your operation and reduce those issues moving forward. So the mapping of your rejections by EDI will allow you to see actionable denials and areas that need to be targeted so that you can fix and, and see those things over time. And they're constantly changing as well. Um, there's different payers that are using different codes for different reasons. And just when you think you have things lined up, something changes and requires an update. So using these reports will help you summarize those issues per payer or figure out where your next deep dive needs to come in and will also help you when summarizing your areas of opportunity for efficiency improvement. Now, this data can also be useful when working with your major payers. Um, so what is also being seen in the industry right now is that insurance hold times are excessive and they have the same staffing problems that the providers are having. So it seems more and more communication is being handled through instant messaging or inquiries through payer portals which you would think would be faster than making a phone call. Um, but what we're seeing sometimes is that when you're doing an instant messaging review with a payer on problematic accounts, it can definitely take an hour or longer. 
and especially while waiting for team members to do their research from the payer side and come back to you with next steps. And if you need to escalate this to a supervisor, I mean, these things can take hours sometimes to actually get someone on the phone to help you fix it. And I don't think that's news to anybody on the call here. Um, but, you know, do you have payer calls set up with your top paying insurances to walk them through examples of these issue accounts or walk them through examples of your denial overviews and kind of see why it's going up or down each month or, you know, biweekly whenever you have those calls. So building account logs of these issues are really going to help you prepare for these calls and bring examples to walk them through and make them reprocess these things in mass instead of manually going through these things one at a time once they're identified. Um, so after looking at the payer scorecard, you know, you really should be looking into your denials and what's driving your delay in reimbursement. So this top 25 rejection slide, um, you know, looking at your Kark and Rark combination is really a good way to view your problems from a high level. And as discussed previously, it can be difficult creating your process to determine the major issue on an account, but once that mapping is completed, it does allow you to see that high-level view. And these are just examples of Kark and Rark rejections and procedure code rejections. But you also want to have the ability to search your denials by financial class, facility, follow-up status, discharge timeframes, check issuance timeframes, as well as Kark, Rark, and procedure code. And that's really going to be giving you a good starting point into looking at what your overall issues are, kind of like looking at it like a pivot table. Um, the graphs on this slide is an example of the top 25 rejection codes um, on a, one of the hospital systems that we work with. And the graph is stacked to show the service areas that are most impacted. So connect with your IT team to look into which tools are out there for analytical assistance to make an analysis less labor intensive. Um, you know, we're currently using Tableau and it's been very helpful for us. Um, everything should be considered a rejection, even if it's 45 and 97 cart codes, which are traditionally contractual adjustments. Um, there is opportunity in each one of these codes to find additional cash or delays driving slowed resolution. Um, this graph is just a starting point and will require some deep dives from your analytical team members to find some wins. And, you know, we're going to be walking through two of the top five rejections on this graph, CARP 186 and CARP 23, so you can see the importance of these analytics. Um, with CARP 186, you can see there's one major service area, which is the emergency room, and CARP 23 has issues affecting multiple service areas. So our major goals are to find out where these issues are coming from. Are these front-end team related? Are they edits or system issues? Or are they payer-related problems? So diving into 186, you know, this slide shows an overview of the top 25 rejections for Humana only. And the reason is that is what we see is 99.9% .9 of the rejections under CARP 186 from the prior slide are truly related to Humana. And CARP 186 stands for level of care change or adjustment to payment made, or simply put, they're downgrading the emergency reimbursement, causing this hospital system to have to prove ER level necessity on almost 2,000 claims. And in this example, the hospital system is getting underpaid on average $163.17 for each claim. So you can see on the bottom right, there's about 10 hospitals in the system, and each is impacted differently than the other. But overall, the system is losing out on $300,000 in reimbursement just on this current portfolio, not counting what's happening ongoing. So the only way to overturn this is to send medical records and hope to prove necessity of how that claim was built. So creating an overview of what issues are within each rejection allow you to have more of a known issues log to share with your staff and keep updated in your staff performance improvement tool. And the more you can drive your staff to respond back with identified trends, the more efficient your team can be in distribution of inventory or working through problematic situations. And anytime there's an opportunity that affects a large group of accounts, see if you can work with IT or create edits or rule-based automated processes to reduce the manual effort needed to work through this example of a very repetitive task.
On our next slide, we're going to be going over CARC-23, which is a little bit more in depth, but um, in this example, you can see there's CARC and RARC examples in the top table. And 23 stands for based on primary adjudication, or as we usually know it as primary paid, more than secondary allows. And this just usually means that the secondary will not COB on an account, and it most likely requires a contractual adjustment. And while this rejection usually ends up in a simple contractual adjustment, there are some opportunities when this rejection pops up. First of all, an edit could be put in place that when this rejection is seen on certain payers, that the remaining balance is written off from a secondary standpoint, reducing the need for a, a manual application to post that adjustment when you see that denial. Um, CARC 23 with no RARC code in this analysis that we found uh, actually found some insurance order issues with Blue Cross and Aetna, which is not an application of this code that someone would necessarily expect. And CARC 23 with an N23 rejections in, in this analysis is identifying that when a secondary pays after Medicare crosses over the claim, that for some reason the payment posting team is posting all these payments as undistributed in their system. And we found out that the root cause was because those were being sent over in a paper EOB and the, the process just couldn't handle it and it was being done incorrectly. So this required somebody to go and manually fix these things and this same combination is also seeing that Medicare is not crossing over their EOB to secondary insurances and causes a required manual rebill. So this would be an example of an opportunity of reaching out to the payer and finding out what's driving that issue and, and how did it happen. And you know, constantly looking into each of your rejections will allow you to not only know what is going on in your operation, but also see where you have opportunities to reduce manual effort and increase cash. So this is an always evolving process. So even when you think you have it figured out, I promise a different situation is gonna pop up making it need a new analysis. All right, and the last thing that we have uh, for today is some additional areas of revenue leakage opportunities. So um, in addition to staff performance and analytics automation, there's a few other areas that can help you to improve revenue. Uh, first of all, with charge master or market-based pricing, you know, do you have a process in place for the HIM coding staff to identify and correct charge master errors, compliance issues, and missing charges? Um, a few things to look into. Um, are you checking invalid HIC picks and revenue codes? Are you checking line items for charge compliance and modifiers? Do you have uh, checking valid code assignments? Are you checking pricing against fee schedules and APCs? And are you reporting and implementing updates consistently? And in addition, reviewing how your price compared to your competition may offer some areas of opportunity to increase or reduce charges to become more competitive. In regards to charge capture, there are disparate data elements which flow together to create a patient claim. And, you know, the goal of charge capture or claim review is to audit and reconcile as many data elements within the claim back to that originating source. So targeting a claim review and tracing the following items from the claim to the medical record, departmental worksheets, or remittance advices is going to help you identify revenue opportunity. So reviewing HIM coded surgical procedures, separately billable nursing procedures, um, supplies, charge capture, uh, codes, and compliance of charges. Um, for drugs, codes and unit multipliers. Um, determination of evaluation and management levels for emergency and clinic visits. And, you know, business office or HIM assigned modifiers and payments and denials. Uh, and then finally, with coding on the revenue integrity portion is, you know, do you have edits set up for your major payers? Is your clearinghouse catching potential coding or billing issues, OCI, CCE, et cetera? If you look into zero balance forensic analysis, you know, just because a balance is zero does not mean that there is not a way to collect on some of those accounts. And performing bad debt reviews and looking into potential lost revenue is a great way to improve future performance as well as reverse some bad debt reserves by collecting some old cash. So Forensic analysis process ensures revenue integrity is also verified. And a few examples of these, which you can see on the wheel here, is 
you know, first of all, contractual integrity. Um, did provider receive full coordination of benefits due from the secondary payers due to their coverage order or billing issues or lack of pursuit of the secondary payer for the full contractual allowable and other secondary payer processing issues? With inpatient surgical days not being reimbursed, sometimes there's unique contractual definition of surgical per diem that can be misapplied by payers. Charge integrity, late charges not billed. The submission of late charges on a claim can result in additional revenue under certain payer, payer reimbursement methodologies. So incorrect revenue code mapping for drugs, drugs that have an assigned HICPIC code that can be billed under 636, drugs that require detailed coding like a HICPIC instead of just a basic Rev code 250 uh, to qualify for certain additional reimbursement per those contract requirements. And um, you know, billing integrity, um, incorrect drug billing, Claims with high-cost drugs that were either coded incorrectly with incorrect units, modifiers, or incorrect HICPIC, or billed with insufficient units may contribute to substantial underpayments. And, um, you know, you could also use device coding as an example where claims were improperly coded with a, a HICPIC indicating like a bare metal stent um, where, you know, implanted with drug-eluting stents. Um, Financial integrity, reviewing accounts that had been reimbursed with post-acute transfer payment reduction per the uh, inpatient prospective payment system, and identified claims where post-acute services were not obtained within 72 hours of discharge. Uh, looking into regulatory review, uh, COVID is a big opportunity. So claims billed to Medicare and Medicare Advantage where COVID-19 treatment occurred were not reimbursed with additional eligible add-on payments. And finally, state legislative integrity, some appeal time limits can actually be extended uh, to rectify underpay underpayments beyond the payer's normal time limits, uh, depending on what those regulations state. Um, and with contract management, I mean, every minute your staff spends working on clerical issues is another minute they're not targeting cash generation. And a large amount of time spent on clerical tasks is going is related to shoring up contract management variances. So if it's a sequestration adjustments, GZ modifiers, incorrect stop loss application, outpatient surgical rules, government fee schedules, there's opportunity to tighten up your expectations and net your system as close to true as possible. And the last piece here is on the legislation side, price transparency. Um, hospital price transparency requirements went into effect January 1st, 2021. CMS can, plans to continue auditing hospitals for compliance, including investigating complaints that are submitted to CMS. Um, is your institution prepared to comply with those requirements of the final rule? And some of the penalties of not being in compliance is uh, potential civil monetary penalties and publicizing that on the CMS website if the hospital fails to respond correctly. And based on the number of beds, they have a low level penalty of $109,000 a year or up to $2 million a year, depending on how big your facility is. And the last thing we had on here was Lab PAMA. Um, so in the CARES Act, which was passed on Friday, March 27, 2020, Congress modified the reporting period in which private payer lab tests must be reported for applicable laboratories. Um, it's a daunting financial reporting test. And the 2019 OPPS final rule, Medicare added that new reporting requirement anytime you had a 1-4-X type of bill. And if you received greater than 12,500 in reimbursement uh, for, for non-patient services on that 1-4 type of bill, um, you have to start reporting that information in 2022 and the penalties could be up to $10,000 per violation per day. Um, so in terms of possible revenue leakage, uh, these are a few areas that we would suggest looking into. And the last thing that we will be going to is a few poll questions here. So uh, first question here is, um, do you all have any solutions for price transparency or lab PAMA? If you could please select uh, the one that applies for you, we'd greatly appreciate that. Give a few more seconds here. And 
again, thank you all very much for your input. We really appreciate it. You have about 15 more seconds. All right. So it looks like a, a solid amount of you are having price transparency only about 30%. That's great to see that you're covered there. Um, looks like 22% of you have both and 48% do not currently have something set up. Um, if you currently are not looking into those things, I really highly suggest that you do um, just in order so that you don't get penalized um, unnecessarily. And the last question that we have in terms of building um, something along the lines as we went through, um, you know, for your automation opportunities, are you doing internal development? Uh, do you partner with a vendor? Have you not started yet, or is it not a current focus? Um, we would definitely appreciate any feedback on this as well. We'll give about 15 more seconds here. All right. So it looks like a lot of you are planning on some internal development as well as partnering with a vendor. And 100% understand if you haven't started or not a current focus. I know there's a lot on all of our plates. Um, and with that, um, my portion is done, so I will kick this over to John. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. That was a lot of great information. Looks like we have a decent amount of questions coming in. I know we're kind of running short on time, so we apologize by, for that. We'll, we'll hit one or two, and we'll make sure we respond directly um, to all your questions as well. Before I hit some of them, just give me one brief moment to bring up our sponsor for today's discussion. That's HFRI. Healthcare Financial Resources. We're a full revenue cycle management outsourcing partner. We work side by side with our clients in order to optimize our hospital revenues with cutting edge technology, expert staff, and decades of experience in full span of revenue cycle management. Okay, um, so with that, let me pull up some of these questions. Uh, here's, here's a solid one about our platform. Um, how long does it take for a solution like your demo showed off to to get um, off, the, off the ground and up and running? Well, Dan, I'll, I'll handle this one. If, if the question's asking about our internally, um, how we build something and how you can build something similar, this is one, something we built utilizing all the process flows, desk procedures, and data gathering that we acquired over the many years working with our clients all over the country. Then we simply decided to bring in some IT resources needed in order to map out and process all these rules and the formulas that we've developed. Um, so we got that up and running, you know, within a year or two. But it was really that that knowledge base over the years that helped that helped drive that. Now, if you're asking how long this technology can be applied to customize it to fit your needs, well, that's basically just an implementation process for us, um, as we have many uh, modules already created, as Dan pointed out. But we can always address that later. So again, I know we're running up on it. Uh, Dan. Why don't we just hit one more question? Uh, this one's for you. How do you coordinate automation when several EHR platforms are involved? That's a great question. Um, I would say, you know, there's a few answers to that question, John. Um, you know, if you find like issues throughout the different platforms, the solution may be able to be applied holistically. Like, um, you know, for example, if you identify that Blue Cross, for example, needs medical records for the following denial situation and you can send it through a carrier web portal. That can be applied for all systems as long as you can identify the data across the board. However, like, um, you know, summarizing what you did and what you automated may have to be separately done. So, like, if I have an archive, you know, legacy system and then I have a newer system, in order to input that data, the bots that you'd be using, in, for instance, of RPA tech, if you're using the bots to import the notes of what you've completed, 
you may have different steps on one platform versus a different one. Um, so, you know, outside of a holistic example, you know, some systems may need to apply an edit for a given situation, and obviously those would need to be applied separately because it's based on the EHR, but it can be done when you have several systems. It just depends what you're trying to get done. Is it within the system or is it based on a bigger issue? That's a great point. All right, well, I know that's all the time we have today. Any question we might have missed, again, we'll make sure we'll reach out, as I mentioned before. Also, please feel free to contact us if interested in seeing an expanded version of our demo and how these processes can be applied to your organization. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to us. We hope you all have a great rest of your day. Take care. Take care. Thanks so much. I want to thank John and Daniel again for an excellent presentation and Healthcare Financial Resources for sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the content presented today, please check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.